Hello and welcome to the AI Digest. My name is Joaquin and with me today is Elaine Luss. Elaine is a PhD student at the Montclair State University and she is also a doctoral research fellow. Um, Elaine, it's a pleasure to have you. Thanks so much, Joaquin. I'm, I'm so excited to be here. I'm a fan of the podcast. Uh, so thanks so much for having me today. Elaine, um, I have to just immediately from the gate say I'm really impressed at how quickly you've traversed your academic journey. Um, you went and you got your bachelor's at Georgetown University in global health. You got your master's degree in education from John Hopkins. And now you're in Montclair State University getting, getting your PhD. Did you take any rest in between any of those uh, milestones or was it just a straight road? Uh, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And no, I, uh, I went straight through. Um, for some people, it works better maybe to take a break, uh, really immerse themselves in in you know different types of work uh for me i knew that i wanted to you know keep keep it going while i had the momentum um the end of my college experience was interesting i graduated in 2020 that you know when that's when COVID happened um so that was a little bit disruptive you know to be on a college campus uh and then you know to come back home um but no i i preferred to just keep on going excellent and with the research that you're doing at um, the Family Science and Human Development Department, uh, can you tell me a little bit more about what your focus is? Sure. Um, so I'm really fortunate to be um, a research assistant at the Wright Institute, um, where we focus on research on youth thriving and evaluation. Um, so I am really passionate about um, youth and creating positive experiences for youth. Um, to know, you know, build a strong character to explore their interests. So, what I do in the lab is I'm working on a few different projects um, where our the Wright Institute partners with um, youth serving organizations or um, universities or different um, kinds of groups around the country and around the globe. Um, and I'm I do a couple of different things. So I do data analysis. Um, you know, I'm analyzing interviews. Um, I help with some operations in terms of um, you know communicating with participants. Um, I am working on writing some papers, uh, creating some interview protocols, doing the interviews, um, all to kind of get at the core of this you know youth thriving in one aspect. Um, different uh, educational initiatives, um, things like that. So, and I'm I'm loving my time there. At this time, the focus of your work is more on an operational, tactical level. Um, at some point, do you see yourself sort of going into the administration of educational institutions and and trying to scale up the impact that you have? Potentially, um, you know what I'm. What I'm really loving right now is kind of being in a position where I'm working directly with students. So um, I was formerly a special education teacher for grades pre-K to three. Um, I'm not in the classroom anymore, but I tutor um, around town, the town I currently live in, um, and virtually with some of my previous students from Baltimore. Um, so I I still love that I'm able to you know work directly with the students. I'm also um, a teaching assistant, so I work with undergrads. Um, but then I also do get to be, um, you know, making some contributing to the decision making of, you know, uh, the research on these initiatives. Um, so long story short, potentially maybe, uh, you know, taking on an administrative role at some point. But um, what I do definitely see for myself is having a role where I can kind of continue that working directly with students while also, you know, working on these research projects that I hope uh, and aim to have like direct impacts on the students I'm working with. Because you're in the world of academia, I just want to understand um, how your bachelor's and master's colored the lens of the work that you're doing now. Sure. Um, so my bachelor's, I, I was a global health major and disability studies minor. 
um, a really cool component of my bachelor's program was that I got to go to Tonga, Tanzania uh, from September to December. And um, I got to be the principal investigator on my own research project in partnership with the uh, National Institute for Medical Research in Tanzania. Um, so, you know, my undergrad experience, the coursework I took kind of like laid the foundation in a lot of really interesting different areas um, ranging from, you know, theology. I went to a Georgetown's a Catholic um, institution to statistics. Uh, when I got to Tanzania, I got to get my, you know, real life practice with the guidance from really incredible researchers um, in, you know, creating a mixed methods study. So writing interview protocols, uh, focus groups, creating surveys. Um, what does it look like getting these projects going in, you know, diverse settings? Um, so, you know, my undergrad really sparked my interest in conducting research with um, diverse populations. And then, you know, it, it was really challenging. I, I might have even felt a little bit burnt out from, you know, the constant waiting, um, you know, things not going to plan during these, like, you know, fairly large scale research projects. Um, I also found there that I was missing the component of like working directly in the community with mm -hmm. the people uh, you know, that I was researching in a sense, I was researching, uh, commercial motorcycle drivers. Um, and something I wish I got to do more was spend time, you know, with commercial motorcycle drivers at their various posts. Um, so, you know, being there helped me realize I really wanted to, you know, be more embedded in the community. I also always loved, um, teaching as a child. Like I would, I was constantly setting up dolls and my chalkboard, you know, teaching lessons. Um, my family values education very much. Um, so I, you know, started to look at opportunities where I could teach in different communities. Uh, that led me to Teach for America, which is an organization where people um, travel to different cities in the United States and um, they become, you know, full classroom teachers. Um, as in, in partnership with Teach for America, I was able to get my master's degree from Johns Hopkins, um, where I lived and taught in Baltimore. Um, and teaching in Baltimore was uh, a really incredible, challenging, beautiful, wonderful experience. Um, so, you know, at at that, that point, I'm now, I have some pretty... Uh, pretty nice research experience. I'm really passionate about the students that I'm working with, um, you know, lesson planning and trying to be interesting and creative, uh, differentiating for my students with um, disabilities. I, I'm not sure if I said this already, I was a special education teacher. Um, also recognizing the, the challenges that, you know, education system is facing that kind of led me to discover this program at Montclair State Family Science and Human Development, which in a way was a marrying of my different passions of public health, research, education, um, and service. Um, so that's kind of what led me to where I am right now. Well, I, I really appreciate the way that um, you are so thorough and clear and outlining your thinking process and your journey. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I just from this conversation, I get the impression you are a really talented and fabulous operator. So, uh, well, you know, thank you. I appreciate I, that. I'm, I'm sure you're doing a great job with uh, working with, with all these uh, students and people up front. Um, it, it seems to be a strength of yours. Uh, just, just from this conversation, I can tell. Thank you so much. Um, you, you, you mentioned your expertise lies in teaching instructional practices using AI and uh, research. So pr primarily experiential research where you're up front and designing, uh, delivering and conducting all sorts of primary sources of, of, of information gathering, right? Yeah. So um, at Montclair State and in the Wright Institute, we are kind of we're starting to break into this space. Um, it's starting in ways where, you know, myself as a, as a tutor and a teaching assistant, where, um, you know, responsibly kind of experimenting, working in these AI tools into the uh, experiences we're creating for students. So, um, you know, some examples are um, 
in the context of working with undergraduates, um, you know, creating discussion posts where students are using ChatGPT as like as a tool rather in you know having the opportunity to see what works what's not working so well if i were to use this on my own what kind of issues would i run into um, so helping students you know use ai such as chat gpt as a as a supportive tool rather than something you know to maybe fully rely on or use to write a paper and not look it over and turn it in um, so you know we're starting and now we're kind of starting to reflect and analyze some data that we've collected through these experiences. Um, and I'm, re I'm really excited for the direction that we're heading in. I appreciate that rather than turning your back in innovations that are impacting society, you're embracing them with open arms and you're trying to figure out how do they fit in the classroom and how can we leverage them to support richer experiences rather than just completely close people off from being able to adopt these technologies earlier on, especially when they're young, pliable minds that can pick these things up and 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 interrogate and figure how to get their hands dirty. Um, so it's really interesting work that you're doing. Um, Thanks. And and I don't blame you know as as students as adults like we see these tools and you know how how things can generate an essay or or generate like a beautiful piece of work, um, I we you know we all might see the temptation to you know claim that as our work and turn it in um, or you know as educators we might say we an, another knee jerk reaction might be ban it say we can't we're not using this in the classroom it's not safe we don't know much about it. Um, but what I do think kind of like what you just mentioned, it's really important, I think, to recognize that these tools are emerging, they're becoming part of the workforce, kids, you know, have access to them when they have access to internet, um, we really need to start, you know, working together to use these tools like responsibly, safely, rather than, you know, the complete rejection, like you mentioned. When I was in grade school in New Jersey, I was exposed to Microsoft Office, uh, Photoshop, and and things of that nature. But I could only imagine, um, you know, some of my other um, colleagues, uh, some of the other people that I went to high school with, they went and they took photography classes, graphic design. They built successful careers uh, very, very early on. They had very good success because they had access to those types of uh, um, educational courses. So um, what you're doing is you're, you're enabling an equitable um, entry point for these students at a young point in, in their development to understand and leverage this for a better uh, position in society later on. Um, so tell me a little bit more about how you're using AI technologies in the classroom with your students, with the people that you tutor, and and, and a little bit about the research that you're doing with with, with AI. Sure. Um, so I I'm really lucky that I get to you know like practice and you know reflect on and try things out with AI and students ranging from as young as first grade to students who are in college um, right now. Also adults, parents of the students that I tutor, um, you know, they can use a lot of these tools in their own business um, to, you know, make their own lives easier. So it's, it's I, I love being able to work across the lifespan in a way. Um, so I'll start with like the younger students that I tutor. Um, so I, social media is another thing I, I do really like to talk about because I feel like it's another you know tool on the internet that gives us access to a lot of people and information. Um, so I've been able to create um, a little bit of like a tutoring business using um, Facebook and Facebook groups, um, and then also just you know maintaining relationships with my former students. Um, so as I start to learn about these AI tools a little bit more, I thought this kids are going to think this is really interesting because we know from the classroom kids. Um, and you know, a lot of people love computers. It's maybe the kid's favorite part of the day to you know hop on their computer and do activities. So I started um, by using the AI uh, Bing, I think it's the Bing image generator. Um, 
And the first time I tried it with a student, um, it was a situation where they didn't have any homework. Um, you know, normally we work on homework together, but I wanted to, we wanted to like use our time valuably. Um, they weren't really in the mood for like, you know, traditional writing prompts. We're working on writing specifically, writing full sentences, writing with descriptive words. So I thought it would be interesting to show them this image generator tool. And um, together, the student and I, so this is um, a fifth grade boy um, living in Baltimore, attending Baltimore City Public Schools. Um, we, you know, worked together collaboratively. So I shared my screen, they typed their sentences into the chat, I pasted them into the image generator, I wrote a sentence. Um, I know the students passionate uh, about YouTubers, um, they like cars. So I have um, an example here. So my student created this awesome poster of a truck um, inspired by his favorite YouTuber. Um, and, you know, while he was able to do that, we were practicing, you know, spelling, descriptive writing, collaboration, creativity um, with a first grade girl that I work with who's focusing on math and word problems. We use the image generator to illustrate a word problem that we were working on about a farm. Um, so, you know, this image shows the different, the different animals, animals are part of the part problem. Of um, cows, goats, sheep. Something I want to note, though, is that these images are not totally accurate all the time. Um, for example, here, you know, we typed in, it might have been something like 42 cows, 56 pigs, and 10 goats. The numbers don't match up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that's something to note. Similarly here, um, a student created a Christmas card. Um, we can see in this Christmas card that the words are not spelled correctly. So while it's a beautiful image and it's fun for students, um, I think a valuable lesson is that it's not always correct. Things aren't always accurate. Um, so, you know, that's kind of my work. Um, I use ChatGPT all the time to create uh, problems that are interesting for students. If I know a student loves Harry Potter and cats, where I'm creating, I'm showing up to my lesson with 10 word problems that include Harry Potter and cats, and we're laughing, we're, you know, and doing math and learning. Um, with my, in, in the undergraduate, um, more, you know, higher college space, um, I mentioned before, we're using, we're giving students opportunities to practice using these tools to support their learning. So an example of an assignment might be using ChatGPT to create an outline for a persuasive essay. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, looking to the library's website and finding a research article that mm -hmm. would fit within this outline. Um, I will say, you know, in the college, a lot of um, educators might be facing situations, and I mentioned this before, where students are maybe turning in things that don't sound like their voice. Maybe they're not able to explain what they turned in. <laughs> um, and, you know, in, I, I really want to give a lot of credit to the head professor of this course. Instead of, you know, creating an environment that was like, you know, we're looking out for people using ChatGPT and, you know, it's going to result in automatic failures. We kind of embraced it in a sense and made it a learning experience. Um, I do think it's really important for universities and schools and teachers and parents and families to talk about expectations of chat GPT with their students so that, uh, you know, it, it's, that creates a more equitable, more fair, um, space, um, in terms of the research. So now, uh, we're, you know, able to, we've collected some data from students, um, I also would like to know when I'm talking about these research projects, um, I'm not talking about specific participants or like specific real data points. I'm talking about uh, my experiences that I've observed or lived or tried out myself. Um, you know, now we're getting a little bit of a better sense of do students like using chat GPT? Um, could they see this as a tool that they'll use in other classes? Um, and so far, you know, I, I the vibe that I'm getting is it's, it's maybe mixed and students want more information about how to use these tools safely. I think it's a really, it's a really great idea to be able to empower early students that are sort of constructing their understanding of grammar with something mm -hmm. that gives them an immediate um, feedback loop on what they're constructing, how language shapes the world that they 
interact with, engage with, and yeah, that's a, that's a really good way to to, to empower them um, to create uh, through their imagination. Also, I appreciate that you're telling them that um, yeah, we're having fun and all, but there's not all, all the chickens that you want are not on the page. So you know that the machine is a little bit faulty, and you have to mm -hmm. pay mind to the defects of, of the machine when you claim this as a, something that you've created. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and um, yeah, let's 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 go back into the into the nitty gritty details of how knowledge is constructed. I think you pay you you painted a very clear image of the way that you implement this technologies and sort of the outcome that you're expecting. And there's some sort of controversy or mixed reactions around the adoption of these tools. But I I, I think talking about the fundamental uh, building blocks of uh, of knowledge for these students would be a good place to start um, sort of yeah. getting into the weeds, uh, get, getting more into the, the details of how this all works together. Um, Absolutely. So let's talk about education as a transformative process and what, what is the function of education in society? Yeah, that, you know, that it's a great, it's a great question. Um, and I think it looks different for different people. Um, but I guess what I could say, you know, as an educator and a student myself, I think a really big like theme or focus that needs to be kind of centered moving forward is this idea of, um, you know, that different people learn differently and individualization, differentiation of learning experiences. So like how information is presented, how students have different opportunities to demonstrate understanding. Um, I think that's like a key theme here. And AI kind of gives us gives us a way to do that in, in quite a lot of senses. Um, I think another thing, however, that's really important to not to, to forget about in a sense is like is background information when using these really cool emerging tools is key. Um, so, you know, students uh, must have some understanding of technology in the sense of, you know, those initial steps of getting to a computer typing in a username and password and, you know, accessing these websites. Um, in, you know, more advanced settings, I have um, a, a classmate who has used um, ChatGPT to do really advanced statistical testing in R, for example. Um, she had, a, she, we took a course together that gave us a, a foundation and a background in R. What does the coding even look like? What are the, what can R even do? Um, and then using, you know, the foundation to kick it up many notches and do these incredible data analysis, you know, with what she was able to learn using a combination of the foundation, how she, how she got there in the first place, plus these AI tools. So you're saying education as a transformative process depends on the outcome we're seeking, right? Uh, yeah, I, I, I guess so. I think, I think it's hard for me to kind of make like a, a blanket statement because yeah, education serves a lot of different purposes and there's like a lot of different outcomes that are happening. So yeah, that's a tricky one. Mm. I think you painted a pretty clear um, description of early early education is more to construct the base understanding of how to engage with society, numbers, letters, colors, mm -hmm. uh, months, years, etc. So how do you interface with the uh, society? And then uh, mm -hmm. as you scale up, you go more towards the specialized knowledge uh, areas right like you went to your bachelor's and master's and you're in your phd to advance knowledge to another degree for for humankind uh and you're doing research to construct new knowledge that other people can implement um proper you know pilot programs in schools and maybe roll out new curriculum so um what yeah. do you think what do you think about the 
what can you tell me about um you, you know the origins of education and and some of the different theories of intelligence and your perspective on that yeah so i think i think um it's changed a lot you know it's something that is constantly evolving you know education looks really different from when i was in my k to 12 you know classroom also in new jersey um to what students are experiencing now i think there's a quite a few different factors at play some of those factors being what's going on in the world at the time um what kinds of you know experiences traumas um passions skill sets are students entering the classroom with in combination with what do the different schools classrooms educational settings have access to um you know based on a variety of different things um i think when i when I think about different theories in education, um, some that you know have been prevalent across decades and today, and how we think about how uh, technology is like changing the educational landscape, I think about social learning theory, um, how people are you know learning from each other. What role does do things like social media uh, play into when? You know, we have students as young as um, even some of my like third grade students had social media accounts. Um, I believe a lot of middle schoolers, I, I read a statistic somewhere that are spending upwards of like six, eight hours a day on social media. Um, you know, and how how does that impact, you know, the way that people are learning from each other outside of the classroom. Social media is now being used inside the classroom too, which I think is a, another pretty cool area to explore. Um, and then I also think about information processing. We, you know, people have more access to technology, YouTube, TVs. You'll see a lot of times in, in restaurants um, or anywhere, multiple screens, maybe in front of a toddler in front of an infant and and how is that impacting the way that toddlers are you know taking information transferring this information from short-term to long-term memory um you know so yeah you just i i constantly am thinking about change and like how technology is you know plays a role in this change Interesting. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you're and you're moving into a very interesting topic that um, our ability to create um, information, new new media, is quickly outpacing our capacity to consume it, mm -hmm. and, and worse yet, consume it responsibly. Um, so, how is this impacting the development of uh, people at different stages of their life cycle whether they're babies whether they're young toddlers children teenagers young adults adults seniors etc um i think that's certainly a, a very interesting area to explore a little bit um i agree so how is uh how how is knowledge constructed in in, in the mind can you just uh explain that a little bit um oh yeah, this is another good question. Um, I wish I knew a little bit more about neuroscience to give you a better answer. Um, but what I'm, you know, thinking at, thinking about from, you know, a, a systems, a, like a more kind of like social systems perspective is knowledge is constructed based on, you know, a few different things that are working together. Um, one of those things I'm thinking, um, like, biology, I'm thinking epigenetics, what kind of food do you have access to? Do you have access to nutritious, you know, fruits and vegetables to kind of help help the brain power get going? Um, do you have a safe space to sleep? Um, do you have, you know, a, an environment that's clean and, you know, can help you stay protected from disease um, and different illnesses? Uh, again, like making the, the brain a little bit more uh, absorbable to information. I'm also thinking about um, who are you, what kind, what you know, kind of people are you surrounded by? I think that plays a pretty big role in you know how knowledge is acquired. Um, you know, you are we're constantly absorbing the 
you know, especially as children and really throughout our whole life, absorbing the thoughts, opinions, um, stories from those who we're surrounded by. Um, and then I'm also thinking, you know, as a, a little bit of a more of like a larger scale thing, how are you interacting with, again, like what's going on in the world? Um, do you, are, are there events that are, you know, causing these major impacts in your life? Um, you know, different traumas occurring. And I, I do want to say one thing I, I, and my, my, my parents have really like instilled this in me that if you, and I don't really know the, the research so much behind this, but if you can have access to, you know, one good adult or one good older person in your life, I think it makes a pretty big difference in terms of someone who's believing in you, supporting you, um, you know, taking you to school, you know, maybe trying to ensure that some books are around reading to you at night. Um, so, you know, I, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I'm thinking of that a lot of systems inter interplaying create knowledge. Thank you for weaving that um, bigger, bigger context that people think about education. It just takes place in schools and in the classrooms. But boy, oh boy, are there so many other external environmental factors that come into play with um, an individual's capacity to learn and grow as mm -hmm. a as an intellectual, as a as a participant in society. Um, yeah, you're right. I mean, if they're not being fed properly, if, if they don't have access to a safe environment where they can be vulnerable and, and, and be creative and play and, and open their minds to things, um, if they have access to quality information from someone they can model their behavior from, like mm -hmm. little little monk kids are little monkeys that imitate their parents or imitate adults. Uh, so, mm -hmm. yeah, modeling is um, a, a concept I'm like super passionate about, I, I have to say, in terms of, I think I was super, super fortunate and had access to excellent models, um, you know, in, in a variety of areas, education, um, also, you know, just trying to be a good person. Um, and as, you know, educators, as parents, as older siblings, um, aunts and uncles, like, I, I think I really encourage us all to be aware of kind of the ways that we're even just speaking to uh, speaking to other adults, speaking to children, um, because yeah, children and adolescents are sponges, you know, kind of taking in um, taking in everything they see. I think it's something super important to keep at the forefront. As again, we talk about like technology and how uh, we as adults are using technology. Um, you know, the ki kids are watching everything, so might as well try to be the best examples we could be. There's a there's a bit of a component of um, self esteem and developing psychologies as to am I you know should I should I be learning this am I capable of learning this can I model myself after somebody else am I worthy of this so it's really yeah no I I really appreciate your your the 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 angle that you take to education which is a social it's a social construct that requires all participants teachers and students alike to be part of that, um, the construction of, 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 of knowledge and self-esteem and expertise and vocabulary and all these things. Um, how, do, how, do, how do you see the change of uh, technology advancements has had in, um, in, in, in the space of education? Yeah, the, you know, it, this is like a really exciting, um, this is a really exciting topic, and I think there's a few different components. Um, I'm thinking about so another thing I'm really passionate of is about um, reading and literacy. Um, one of the first, from my understanding, um, and you know, I, I also do always like to say I'm, I'm always learning. Um, if you know people have um, information to share with me, I'm always like receptive, and I'm always looking to learn. Um, so my understanding of some of the first steps of technology and education 
are using like online um, reading programs to help kids learn how to read. There's a lot of advantages of that, that these online reading programs are interesting to kids. There's the games, songs, cool pictures happening on the screen. Um, they adjust to students' progress. So, you know, that aspect of individualization, differentiation. So those online reading programs, I think, were a, a pretty monumental uh, thing that happened in education. And I think it's, you know, now that we have access to so many more really advanced technology, um, I think I would love to explore how to capitalize on that more. Um, another thing that I'm seeing a little bit more and I would love to get my hands into is using virtual reality, uh, you know, in the classroom. Um, I've heard stories of using virtual reality, using a combination of AI and virtual reality to give students the opportunity to literally like walk around inside mm -hmm. a story, um, you know, and talk to a character in a story. And I, I that that's so incredible to me. Um, you know, so I think technology is really boosting the overall engagement and interest. And that's our super, in my experience, a super important part of, you know, learning that sticks is students being interested in, in what they're doing. Um, I think also in terms of, you know, I think in, when I was in school and when, um, you know, my parents were in school, handwriting was a pretty big component. Now, I think there's less of a little bit less of an emphasis on handwriting because all essays are being turned in, uh, you know, with computers typing. Yep, exactly. I think something that's really cool about that from, you know, a disability perspective is that there's a lot of technology such as text to speech, um, technology that tracks eye movements, that's making writing um, and conveying knowledge and sharing ideas way more accessible uh, to people. So I think that that changes education as well. Um, I also think about Zoom. Uh, you know, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, when, you know, schools, a lot of most in-person learning shut down uh, and learning it, you know, learning didn't necessarily stop. There were a lot of, there were a lot of challenges, especially in cities like Baltimore, um, you know, in, in making sure that every people were connected with laptops, um, you know, a quiet, safe space to be on Zoom, um, internet access. Um, you know, but that changed the educational landscape as well. We all, we were doing a lot of Zoom learning. I think it's pretty cool that um, people, we can have guest speakers now Zoom in from all over the world. I was super excited to Zoom into my um, mentor from Tanzania, his um, PhD dissertation. I, I was able to be there because of Zoom. Uh, and I, you know, learned all, all even more about his research. Um, and then, you know, we're kind of uh, one of the really popular things today is like AI and how how AI is transforming education. I think I like to think about it in con the, in the context of what you said earlier of um, you know self esteem. And I'm not sure that if we hadn't tried it out in our tutoring session with my uh, some of my students, I'm not sure if they would see themselves as artists and graphic designers. Um, and now they do, which is pretty amazing. I also like to note that those the tools were free. We didn't, we I didn't pay any, you know, extra uh, cost to create this experience where you know the students felt really empowered, confident, um, things like that. I think it's changing self directed learning quite a bit too. I shared the example of my um, classmate who did incredible things with R and Chat GPT. Um, you know, this gives students a way to explore things that they're interested in, um, you know, test test things out in a more efficient time time frame. I do think it's important, however, though, to talk about um, the safe the safeguards in a sense and the, you know, possible concerns that are coming up with AI. Um, you know, when we think about like, play, we you know, we have to think about plagiarism. Um, we have to think about safety of, you know, young students having access to, you know, in theory, they can ask this tool of any question that they want. Um, yeah. It's a whole nother area that's really interesting to explore. Yeah. Kindergartners shouldn't know how to make napalm or 
how to how to have access uh -huh. to dangerous, potentially self harming information. Um, exactly. Okay. Well, let me ask you this: What are the challenges? Uh, what are the difference in challenges for um, constructing learning experiences with children versus uh, adults? Oh, that's a great question. I think they're kind of similar, like in a, in a lot of ways. And I think it's, they're, they're similar because this is kind of like a new tool for everybody. Um, you know, it's, it's new for everyone. A lot of people don't really have experience in it. I would say maybe challenges that are specific to, to you know, my younger students, first, second, third, fourth, fifth graders um, are, you know, still things like the the literacy foundations that we're working on, you know, spelling things, uh, writing things in a way that the computer is going to understand. Um, you know, like I mentioned, something pretty cool is that we do have text-to-speech, you know, in theory, uh, the student could talk into the, you know, computer and have their sentence written out. Now, that's, that's more accessible for some people. Um, I also believe that, you know, challenges in connecting younger students with AI while keeping them safe it is 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 kind of unique to the younger ones. Um, this is something again. I would I would love to have like more discussion, um, you know, from people maybe with more experience than myself on how they connect the younger kids with tools in a safe and responsible way. I know I personally, you know, I I show them. Um, but I'm not really showing the younger kids how to get to the website. I always make sure to say, you know, um, we're going to practice using this tool. Um, you know, if you ever want to use it, we have to use it with an adult. Uh, it's, you know, it's, that's, that's the safest way. And I have not run into challenges yet in terms of kids, you know, going out and, and using it on their own. Um, making sure that the parents are okay with, you know, these tools being used. Um, and then specific challenges with, um, you know, maybe like the older students are, you know, conveying the idea that although it's, it's very tempting to have Chad GPT generate a paragraph and paste it into our essay, um, we need to use it as a tool, like rather than a, uh, something to rely on. Um, I also think maybe the there's there could be some level of like frustration amongst college students. You know, they've had their their way of doing things for a little while now, and to to learn this new tool is maybe could result in some frustration of like I don't think it works. I'm I'm not really interested in using it. Um, so yeah, and I think like the fact that teachers are learning at the same time that students are learning about it is can be tricky as well. How is this uh, providing equity for um, people of different backgrounds, diversity? How is this uh, enabling them to be able to receive a richer, more personalized education? Yeah, so I, I think that this is a, another super, super important topic. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the things that I mentioned already that I really value about a lot of these tools are that there's free options. Um, you know, teachers' salaries across the country are, gro the teachers are grossly underpaid. Um, so the fact that this is a, uh, in a lot of senses, a free tool that teachers can use, um, is really amazing. Also a free tool that, you know, students themselves can use is, is incredible. Um, I also think that the accessibility tools that are built into a lot of these features, um, the fact that, you know, we have text-to-speech, we we're combining maybe images and words and sounds, the, this, this multimedia like sensory input is really, uh, you know, helps create equity. Um, I think that people, you know, I well, I, I do, I actually do want to mention that when we're using tools like chat, GPT, you know, as, as far as I know, things that take information from the internet and then spit something out, 
um, we do definitely have to be aware of potential biases and you know maybe stereotypes and incorrect perceptions that the AI tools are perpetuating about different um, groups of people. So I, I do want to flag that as something uh, to be wary of. However, you know, just giving giving people various ways to express themselves and look for information, I think, um, I think is, you know, helping us. There's, there's still quite a bit of work to be done, but I think we're taking some good first steps in the direction of yeah, using these tools to increase equity. I see uh, platforms like Khan Academy have uh, implemented um, very narrow, narrow versions of a chat GPC in in the areas that they teach lessons in. and i find that to be a a way to bring equity to students of any you know income or demographic or infrastructure uh space and and as you said it gives them the opportunity to be self-directed in their learning and take control of i don't have to ask the teacher 50 questions if i don't get it in class but i can ask and abuse this private virtual tutor exactly. to help me with my homework, explain it. Sometimes, as you said, there's not enough adults at home that you can model positive behavior from, uh, from or, mm -hmm. you know, you, you can't always ask your mom, dad, older brother, older sister, cousin, help me with my trigonometry. If mm -hmm. everybody, you know, chose a different profession or they don't have a maths background or they just didn't receive the privilege of of the same kind of education that's afforded in and you know some of the american institutions we have today so um yeah great point i that's that's an excellent point and i think um like what you mentioned about the tutor i I've, I've also heard examples of um you know uh parents somehow training like chat gpt to be a math tutor for their child um and tutors are expensive i you know, I do definitely try to uh, meet like the families that I work with where they are. Um, but I know there are a lot of tutors and tutoring groups that are that are just not accessible um, for um, people. people. So that's a great point that you brought up. Yeah, I'm just uh, I'm, I'm an old school person when it comes to knowledge acquisition. You read a book, you write an essay you draw some doodles on a page and you just keep doing that until you refine something that's worthy of um of representation of the of, of the world of reality um yeah yeah how, how are we going to build a, a good society with uh education being a cornerstone of that where do we take this uh powerful technology this this newfound Prometheus's fire uh, to to produce something of value. Yeah, you know, um, so one one of the things that actually comes to mind is, again, like thinking of, you know, youth, um, is that I would love to see a little bit more of these like large tech organizations, maybe even like like an open AI or a meta or things things of that nature partnering with people so you know youth included um to kind of like you know incorporate the needs concerns tendencies thoughts of people who are using these tools and the people who are creating regulating them uh i i think that's going to be a, a core component of creating a society where these these tools can be used safely responsibly helpfully and not in ways that are you know more destructive than positive um so in, in addition to like the partnerships i think i think i would encourage you know schools to kind of embrace embrace ai and emerging technologies and you know, it administrators, school districts, principals, teachers invest time in you know figuring out, playing around with how to use these tools, so that you know youth are leaving school prepare a little bit more prepared, ready to interact with these tools. Um, and 
you know, research, I think, I think I'm seeing more and more research. Research is super important in understanding exactly how people are impacted and what kind of changes need to be made. Um, coming from the evaluation space, I can't wait to get my hands a little bit more in, um, in, you know, evaluating the different strategies, organizations, groups, um, and, you know, using that data to make uh, positive changes. From your perspective as a hands-on researcher, from architecting the experiment and sort of what are the primary means of collecting information? How do you validate or invalidate that your hypothesis is correct? And quantifying the impact of your of your efforts, um, how would you go about validating the impact of these technologies whether it's having a positive or a negative impact on students, how long would that take? And, you know, what does that look like? Just, I'd love to yeah. get a better, better idea how that works. Yeah, I so I think uh, one of the first things that is coming to mind is like mixed methods. I would love to see, I think it's really important that as, you know, small scale, a teacher collecting data on their students, which teachers do on a daily basis anyway, or large scale research companies um, working with thousands and thousands of people. I think um, getting a combination of, you know, metrics, whether it's how much time is spent using these different tools, um, what, what are the prompts being used, um, you know, these measurable inputs and outputs, I also think it's really important to be collecting data in the sense of interviews, focus groups, um, creating spaces where people feel comfortable sharing what's went well, the gripes that they have, the questions that they have. So I really um, encourage and I'm excited to be doing like getting into mixed methods type research. I also think um, that the research needs to be happening on every level so like i kind of mentioned you know teachers even with their own small groups of students tutors who work with maybe even one you know one child at a time parents who are um you know are watching their children maybe start to use this technology or ai as part of classroom assignments um so you know the research needs to start as small as small scale as like in home to as large scale of these of the organizations that have a lot of the power, um, partnering with you know community members and people who are impacted. How long is it going to take? I think it's it's mixed. I wish I had a better answer for you. Um, you know, on smaller scales, um, in the context of you know a project that I'm working on right now, where we are collecting data from the you know about approximately like 50 students we worked with you know once that data is in we can pretty quickly start looking at it and adjusting for next semester's course um you know so that that could be pretty rapid and i think that's encouraging for people and it's encouraging for parents and teachers that uh it doesn't need to be a a, a super long scale thing these we could we could get data and feedback pretty rapidly but I also do think it's going to be interesting to do, you know, these longitudinal, longer scale projects where people who are in fifth grade starting to use these technologies, what's, you know, happening when they're entering, you know, if they decide to enter college when they're 50 years old. So I think it's, I think it's mixed. And what is the utility of collecting all this primary research and asking people how they feel, what they think? How is that being um, leveraged to make informed decisions on how to tweak and tune the curriculum that's being implemented? Yeah, great question. So I think the good the good news is that teachers are used to this kind of thing, um, you know, collecting data and then recognizing, okay, maybe this book choice that I used didn't really resonate with my students. I'm going to do something else. Okay, maybe my students, um, I need to incorporate some more tactile activities in my reading lesson, in my lesson uh, to, you know, help students become more engaged. Um, so in, in the context of, you know, inside the classroom and outside, um, I think it's going to be helpful in this, you know, to keep up with these emerging, rapidly evolving situations um, for educators to make 
quick decisions, even as quick as from a assi weekly assignment to weekly assignment. Um, because, you know, I, I'm, I feel really strongly about this team of like, we're all learning about it. There's, they're, they're really, you know, we're learning together. Um, I also think that just, you know, we don't like, yeah, like we don't quite have the answers yet. So I, I think this rapid, even day to day change is, uh, and that collection and analysis is pretty important. For a brand new institution that's looking to implement these AI technologies, and they're sort of, they they waited and held their breath to see what the hell was going to happen. Mm -hmm. How would you advise uh, a smaller resource constrained institution in implementing a way for them to dip their toes in the water, so to speak, to 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 make sense of all this noise and provide some low energy but high impact value for their students? Yeah, I, I, I'm I super happy to talk about this. So um, some things that have worked well in my experience at Montclair State and at the Wright Institute was that are that um, in, an office within Montclair State has provided these uh, Zoom, basically information sessions on, um, you know, that, that range from people who have maybe never heard of AI and want to maybe get the basics down to people who are now becoming really comfortable with it and want to embed it in every aspect of their curriculum. Um, so I think, um, you know, kind of like traditional basic information sessions are a good place to start with creating some, um, in, in the case of Montclair State, I have these awesome PowerPoints where I can, you know, click on links directly in the PowerPoint um, to get to its specific resource. Um, so, you know, free, Free information sessions, I think, could are are a valuable tool here. I also think I would encourage universities or organizations to kind of come together and come up with some sort of starting policy on or expectations on what is cool, basically, with AI use in the classroom and what is not cool. Um, and you know, I think I would love to see maybe a university could create. Uh, a university-wide, maybe short survey or short interview protocol shared with all of the staff and, um, you know, professors uh, to administer to their students at the end of a session, like kind of how right now students, um, you could do course reviews where you're, you know, you're answering a couple questions on how you like the course, how you like the professor, um, embedding some, some data collection opportunities on AI, I think would be a great step as well. Um, also, I I did, this is actually what I should have said first, um, asking the university staff and students like what they need, what, what would be helpful, because it's gonna look different at every university and every kind of setting. Um, like, you know, getting some idea of what would, what would be most helpful um, for you. I think those are some places maybe to start. If you were to wave a magic wand and create an institution and resource was not a constraint for you, how would you build a, an, an organization for a group of young, pliable minds and, and for adult learners that need to be upskilling in, in um, real world uh, career driven uh, skill sets? Hmm. I almost like the first thing that comes to mind is a library, a library type like model in a sense. And what would you do have libraries like universities have libraries. So maybe what I'm picturing is like a room in a library or some kind of setting where um, people could basically come and exp experiment in, in different ways in a in a setting where maybe there are some people who are, have, you know, proper training, um, passionate about um, AI, people who are aware of strengths and possible drawbacks, possible risks. Um, some kind of like community space where students, adults in the community, people can bring their kids um, to have access to, to try out all of these different tools, maybe a virtual reality station where, you know, we could, we could build a, a setting and you know, build some characters and then pop on the virtual reality goggles and see what it's like. Um, 
you know, maybe some ideas of activities where people can, you know, ask maybe chat GPT to write a poem, a, a comedy uh, skit, you know, something like that. I, I just would love to see um, collaborative, safe, excited experimentation kind of with, uh, with AI. And uh, for adults? For adults, I think, you know, I, I like spaces where um, adults, adults, youth, college students, everyone could kind of interact together. I find that especially from, so adults, adults included, I think in what I just described, um, I think it's advantageous for a lot of people to be able to go to a learning experience or anything with their family. I'm thinking about, you know, parents and and kids of different ages, you know, it might be most convenient for that whole family to go somewhere together and do some learning. Um, so yeah, I think, it, I think adults are, are right there included. I appreciate that, um, that perspective that uh, there's no, there's no real barrier to knowledge and it's a particip it, it, it's very much a, a team sport. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody's an active participant, even though you have different levels of expertise or knowledge. Uh, centers of learning, I think that's what they call them in kindergarten classrooms, that they have yeah. the color, coloring station and, uh, you know, uh, nap time station, snack time station, yeah. all these different tactile areas where you can pick up resources and um okay, I do this or, you know. It, it... Yeah, and those are super valuable. And th that's some of our most like transformative learning experiences. So yeah, that's a great connection. Well, Elaine, um, is, are there any words of advice that... for educators that are experimenting with this? If you were to prescribe in, in a three-step process on how to just engage, where would you, where would you get started? Hmm. I would say experiment, collaborate, and adjust. I would say, um, you know, you have to start somewhere. So giving, even just opening the website, um, trying some prompts out, trying different websites. Um, so giving things a try. I also, uh, the second part collaboration, being that so much of the information that I got as a classroom teacher that I get today as a tutor and as a student myself, um, things that I'm passionate about I are from other people, Facebook groups, um, like, you know, things like LinkedIn, things like TikTok. I follow uh, tons of teachers who I'm, you know, they play video. I immediately go to the website and download the resource. Um, X uh, is another place uh, where I'm, I'm getting ideas all the time. Um, so that second step is collaborate also with your coworkers, your family, your friends, uh, people you admire, um, people you look up to and adjust. Um, you know, always reflecting, uh, thinking about what worked well, what didn't work well, talking to your students, talking to your students, parents and families, um, the service providers in the schools, the social workers, the school psychologists, um, administration, um, you know, adjusting based on what you're seeing. I think, I think those are three, um, three steps to get started. Well, Thank you very much, Elaine, for giving us a, a bit on your background and helping us understand how we can wield AI to provide more equitable experiences for students at different levels of development. Um, I certainly learned a lot, and I I appreciate you pr providing such a wide um, context map as to it's not just the lessons in the classroom. It's, it's the whole world that needs to participate in the learning experience of a of a person um and we're helping we're all helping each other so absolutely mm -hmm. we're all in this together thank you elaine thank you so much